I would like you to meet uh, Niraj Badan from Accenture. He's going to introduce our panel. Thanks. Thank you, Russ. Good morning. It's a hard act to follow Russ, and I'm going to try to keep this brief because I think I loaned him two or three of my minutes here. So with that, as Russ said, my name is Neeraj Vedan. I'm a senior managing director. Don't, you don't want to leave for this panel, please. Um, I know that maybe we'll have a break shortly. I'm Neeraj Vedan. I'm a senior managing director with Accenture, global company, but one that is very locally committed to working with organizations like Joint Venture Silicon Valley. We've had a presence in Silicon Valley, and we're committed to working with the organizations that are delivering impact right here to improve how we work and live in our communities. Now that we've been briefed, on the state of the economy, I have the privilege to introducing three distinguished guests who will discuss what this means up for the companies and communities in Silicon Valley and for all of us. You already have their bios. You've heard some of it earlier already. So I will not rattle them off here and attempt to, to cover all of that. Needless to say, each of them comes to us with a truly impressive resume and a long list of credentials. Instead, I want to focus on why Joint Venture invited these select individuals to join us today and why we are grateful for them to spend the morning with us. First, let's start with Annalise Saxenian. It's not a stretch to tell you that she created a whole industry of Valley Watchers when she wrote the book on Silicon Valley. It was the regional advantage, and it argued that Silicon Valley became the US's innovation capital because of our decentralized and informal style of competition and collaboration. It was published by Harvard in 1994 and became an instant classic. Professor Saxenian brings a nuanced scholarly perspective and in-depth understanding of Silicon Valley. We're eager to hear her take on the spot we're in right now. We also wanted to invite someone who's out there in the thick of it. <laughs> Somebody starting companies, getting them funded, making bets and taking risks. That person is Somesh Dash. Somesh is a partner with IVP, one of Silicon Valley's storied venture capital firms. We are gravitated to him because of his history of growth investments in things like enterprise software, mobility, digital health, and more. You might have heard of some of the companies that he's invested and advised in, Uber, Dropbox, Netflix, Slack, only just to name a few. Somesh, we're deeply interested in what you're seeing and hearing these days and where you think this region is heading. And finally, our moderator, John Markoff. John covered technology for the New York Times and has added Stanford to his resume. He's fantastic at probing questions and unearthing hidden insights and new perspectives. John, we know you'll be asking the provoking questions. We're also counting on you to add your own views and test them against others. We're very happy to see you this morning and eager for now for you to get started. So John, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. What an interesting time. I, so I, I'm one of the natives here. You're a native uh, Silicon Valley person as well. So I've been through, I think, five recessions living and working in Silicon Valley. And um, I, I think that Russ captured this to a T. I'm that guy who feels like this. Um, if it's not a recession, it's certainly an unusual time. Uh, layoffs versus record, uh, record uh, low unemployment, population declines uh, versus rising housing costs, growing wealth, growing poverty. So I want to start by asking you guys, um, if this is a downturn, and maybe it's not, why is this downturn different than all other downturns? Where are we? Um. I think it's a downturn. I think it's, I would call it a correction. It's one of those cyclical corrections with the new technologies that Russ mentioned. I think um, what is different is that we are in a world, it, it, the prior one, say 1985, we were the center of the action. So there was one Silicon Valley. Now there are all of those regions around the US and around the world, India, China, Israel, um, that are also absorbing. However, I, I believe that Silicon Valley will continue to be the core of the innovation uh, that then gets parceled out and other regions become uh, sort of partners for Silicon Valley. So you'll see in India a lot of incredibly good software development that is a, but it's a partnership 
or in Taiwan, where they're making the chips and manufacturing the chips that were designed here. So this is a, a network of collaborators, by and large, one exception, um, uh, and on also collaborative regions around the US. So this, this one is different because the technology is new. We've got AI around the corner. But I think you know these layoffs, every, all, 1985, 91, all of those headlines that Russ showed you, you worried about the layoffs. Those people went around and started new companies. So you're recycling talent. This has amazing talent. The depth of talent in this valley is unparalleled in the world, as well as all the services that allow it to recombine very quickly. So what we're seeing now is that recombination process. Um, so yeah. I, I guess I just think we are, it's, it's another correction, it's new technology. We are more networked globally than we have been before. But as Mayor Hicks mentioned, thank you for the mention, um, I will never predict, <laughs> I'm not gonna predict the demise of Silicon Valley again, I've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wrong and, I, and I, um, I think that you will see in the next decade a new wave, a new generation of startups. Uh, well, the one thing that I will add though, just as a footnote, there are two things that concern me about the data. Part of it which, which Russ pre um, presented, part of it he didn't present, but it's there in the index. Uh, the concentration in a small number of companies has never been there before at the same scale as Russ said. And that, it, we're not at a point where I worry about it much, but that's how regions start to stagnate. Yeah. When you get, you know, think about Detroit and three big companies that really dominate the economy. These companies don't dominate quite the way that they did in Detroit, but if we continued along that trajectory, I would worry about that. Um, and the other worry that I've had since the late 80s, and it doesn't seem to slow things down that much, but the inequality just continues to worsen, as does the how, cost of housing and the, the transportation problems. And, yeah. and those things are big concerns that I hope that people in this room will continue to think about. <laughs> Especially if you agree with Anno that this is a correction, what is this drumbeat of uh, layoffs about? Um, it feels like central casting. Um, all the CEOs take personal responsibility and then they cut, what, five, 10 percent of their workforce? What's going right. on? Right. Well, I think it's important to remember this charts just showed that I think there's a recency bias, as you know, John, in, in news that's always there. And so there's always this headline inducing thing on CNBC when you wake up in the morning that. Google lays off 5,000 people, and that's horrible. Like, one of the things that we're seeing is how much this affects community life, how much it affects employment, families, you know, mortgages, student loans. I mean, the, the spillover effect, John, about layoffs is not just the individual and the job at that point in time, it's the repercussions to the family. But on the other side of it, what, what we just talked about before this session was literally how much growth has happened since the pandemic started. So a lot of this is actually just right-sizing. I would add, you know, to the prompt that you just had, the thing that wasn't mentioned before that no one's mentioned is interest rates. The reality is we had a period of yeah. zero interest rates, unprecedented in, in world history, forget American history, and that caused, I think, the more natural progression that would have happened had we not had the correction in interest rates was a more linear growth in jobs. Instead, we saw a hyperactive employment market, a hyperactive funding market, a hyperactive IPO market, and as an example, our firm, you know, I think we had 13 IPOs in 2021. We usually have two or three. We had zero last year. <laughs> so that just gives you a sense of like how things are correcting. Um, I think the other, the other thing I would say about the layoffs is that in our portfolio, we surveyed 90% of people that were affected by a reduction in force or a layoff have found employment within a year. So the absorption, which is what Russell was talking about, is the key thing. Most of these people are actually finding new jobs. They're also learning new skills. Anna mentioned AI. There's lots of new vocations that are coming up. You know, prompt engineering is a term that nobody had heard about five years ago. Now that is the most difficult but valuable position within AI companies. I'll add two things that Anna said that I worry about long term. The first is the, the chart on immigration worries me a lot. Yeah. Anna and I were talking beforehand. I was also a student of Anna's at Berkeley. And, uh, <laughs> and one of the things that she did a lot of seminal research on was you know, the Indian immigration migration to Silicon Valley and how that helped create the foundation of lots of technology companies. What we're seeing now is the difficulty in getting visas and getting work permits combined with rhetoric that was not positive yeah. for a few years. That's causing a lot of those people to stay in Bangalore or Mumbai and start companies funded by folks like us. So I think that is a trend that we need to watch. 
The other is actually mental health. If you think about what's happening in the region, as we see poverty increase, inequality increase to what Anna was saying, crime increase, a lot of that has to do with a lack of recognition that mental health is sort of frayed in a difficult spot. I think what we're seeing in this region, but also in San Francisco, is the increase of fentanyl, the increase of drug usage, the lack of community health uh, facilities is leading to, I think, maybe a society that may economically progress, but the day-to-day -day life may become more difficult. Yeah. I don't want to leave the tech layoffs just yet, because I wonder, you know, it, it, if you look at those numbers, it looks, they don't, they don't even show up. They're, they're not there, and yet, like, just in the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at rental housing in Palo Alto, for example. And all of a sudden, there are houses to rent in Palo Alto. There are never houses to rent in Palo Alto. Is there a, a lag factor that we're going to see? And if tech is the driver, what is the, you know, the sort of the, the pebbles in the water kind of effect for the rest of the valley? Yeah, I'm happy to start. I mean, my partner, Tom Lavera, wrote a really interesting tweet about this that some of you <laughs> probably saw, which is, I think we should also remember that I, I wouldn't say this day, this morning is the end and suddenly we're rebounding back. The reality is we're gonna probably see continued layoffs and softness through this year, potentially into next year. And this is obviously up for heated deb debate with everybody here. I would say um, what we're more likely to see you know, is actually a slow regrowth in companies. We're not gonna see, I think, you know, the kind of Funding markets ratchet back. Venture firms are now realizing that part, part of, I mean, we were talking about this before, and part of the reality of venture capital is it's a difficult industry to scale because a lot of what we do is not like public markets. We actually work on boards of companies. We work with management teams. We help with hiring. So adding you know, lots of companies while you can't exit any is a recipe for disaster. Right. And so it, it is a business that is more artisan. And so the good news is that I've, I've been stating to my partners, I've never seen a cohort of more battle-tested entrepreneurs. Okay. These are entrepreneurs that have actually gone through the pandemic. Remember PPE loans? Yeah, that's where it started a couple years ago. They've been through the hyper growth of 2021 and a downturn starting in 2022. They're ready for anything. Yeah. Can I, can yeah. I add to that? Just on your question about the layoffs, the first line that Russ showed about the, the headlines, the negative headlines, in 1985, Business Week said that Silicon Valley was going down the tubes. 20,000 jobs were lost then. It's only that it's, we're expecting 20,000 now. That's not that many. The economy is much bigger. Yeah. So I think there is a lag time, and, and everything Sinesh said is right. Yeah. The, the view from Sand Hill Road, uh, you know, those, those two bar charts, the big uptick and then the next year, but is the mix changed in some way? I think I saw in the report that actually angel investing has fallen off the cliff. So what's going on in the venture community? I was surprised to see that too. I got to follow up with Russell on that one. I didn't, I didn't see why that from where he said, and I'm so glad you mentioned Sand Hill Road. That's a word that's been forgotten. Actually, Sand Hill Road's in Menlo Park. It's where all the VCs were. <laughs> Suddenly, it seems like a lot of venture firms are opening offices in New York and in international offices. I think the view really from Sand Hill Road is that this is a period of recalibration. So the reality is, there's a great book you know, that I, I'd recommend to everybody by Sebastian Malaby called The Power Law. Venture capital has always, in some ways, been driven by asymmetric risk return and a few breakout industries, and within, within those, a few breakout companies that drive the majority of a fund's return, a firm's return, and the industry's return. Google, Meta, you know, Uber, these are all examples of that for the different eras that they were in, Salesforce, Oracle before that. I think what has gotten everybody in Sand Hill Road excited, actually, if you, if you were to go around, is there are new industries that are top of mind. I mean, we're AI, what's remarkable is AI has been academically a topic that we've all debated for decades now, but we're finally seeing, I think with ChatGPT and OpenAI, a consumer recognition of just how big this could be and how much things are gonna change. It, I, have, I mean, we're sitting in Mountain View, we're probably in you know, breathing distance. It's the first time you could tell Google is actually scared <laughs> of what could come. Yeah. I would say the application of AI, though, is much bigger than what we're seeing consumers, whether it's healthcare, whether it's you know, military technology, whether we're seeing it in consumer technology, that's one aspect of it. We're also seeing you know, the first pod in, in that chart you know, was defense. That's where it all started here in Silicon Valley. You know, one of our advisors actually here in the audience today, Rich Clark, who ran special operations, um, we were talking yesterday. A lot of what we're seeing today is that the real software and data required to arm the United States for the next generation of industrial and military warfare is gonna come out of Silicon Valley as well. And I think there's also a shift in thinking of 
let's stay away from all that stuff that touches the public sector to more let's lean in and build systems really that have been. I want to come back to AI, but I, um, Anna, you brought this up just briefly, wanna, but I want to focus on it because I think it's the process that makes Silicon Valley, which is um, undisputably multicultural. And in, in your book, New Argonauts, you talked about this idea about brain circulation as opposed to brain drain, where the right. drain was from the other parts of the world where the talent was coming to Silicon Valley. And I think that those networks that you identify are the heart of what's kept Silicon Valley rich and thriving over a long time. If you look, even today, I was just looking at census data, um, four or five of the major cities of Silicon Valley, foreign-born residents are more than 50% right. of the population. Right. I think that's an extraordinary. Well, uh, 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 the the uh, question I want to ask yeah. you is, what happens when geopolitical forces, like the relationship with China, actually stops that yeah. process? I, I worry about this a lot. Actually, I've been worrying about it. This is Swamesh actually mentioned this briefly. I, since 9-11, we have been cutting back on our openness to immigrants, and there's been a sort of growing hostility even. The public domain, people talk about immigrants. It used to be that Silicon Valley was the place that people from Asia, everywhere in the world came, and this was the most welcoming place, and they loved coming. Certainly when I started my research, you know, this was just the floods of people from China, Taiwan, India, Israel. Um, that has slowed down. You see it at the university especially. And we keep getting, you know, notices from the powers that be that we have to be very careful about certain immigrant groups and whether they work in our labs. And I think that is one of the things that threatens Silicon Valley and California and the U.S. economy very, very deeply. And can uh, India supplant China in, in, the, in the sense that? I, you know, we're, we're in an interesting time. In some sense, the U.S.-India partnership has never been more logical, right? We have the two largest democracies between them, you know, in, between the two countries. We're, getting, we're gonna have more than two billion people by 2050. And I actually think part of what I saw recently on visits to Asia is uh, Singapore becoming a hub where a lot of the capital markets and family offices are moving there, and they're very interested in Silicon Valley. India being very welcoming. There was a huge um, agreement signed just a few days ago between the Department of Defense in India and Boeing, which is the largest aviation deal in Indian history, 200 Boeing aircrafts that both presidents and prime ministers uh, Modi signed off on. I, I think the more important thing for Silicon Valley, though, is that this area, my parents emigrated in the 70s for employment in the technology industry and graduate school before that, has had such a long cultural tie with India. I mean, you don't have to go very far here in Mountain View to find great Indian food, right? And so, <laughs> uh, the good, good Indian food. Good Indian food, yeah, that's not great. Um, but I think, I think what's important is that the new entrepreneurs we're meeting are actually people who are very comfortable in some sense having a hybrid. Their companies may be headquartered in Bangalore, they may have their families there, but they're spending months here in Sunnyvale and Mountain View and Palo Alto. They're hiring developers here. Most of the companies I see are actually utilizing this as an opportunity more than a threat. I think the, the more important thing though is the rhetoric to what Anna was saying so that we become again a welcoming society that enables I think people to feel safe here and not targeted so that ideally it's not just economically a region that grows but also a place where culturally we can also grow too. Yeah. Let's, let's get to the current uh, frenzy, uh, language models, AI. Um, before we start, I have to say, as someone who's covered this going back to the, um, the first AI winter in the mid-1980s, um, the Valley has just gone through this remarkably thoughtful conversation, which began in 2011 or 2012, about artificial intelligence ethics. Um, we held a conference at Asilomar, just the way the molecular biotechnology, biotechnology industry did. They were thinking deeply about it. And uh, Stanford set up this organization, Human Centered AI, it was supposed to be about ethics. And then somebody put five bucks on the table. Um, Google appeared weak, and everybody just broke their back lunging for the opportunity. I mean, it's, it's, it's unseemly what's going on in, in that sense. On the other hand, you can completely understand it. Um, the Valley works in the sense of monopolies through choke points, and Google had a choke point for two decades. And now Microsoft et al. see Google as being vulnerable. And there's this rush to find the next ch choke point, the next monopoly, and it looks like it might be around language models. Um, so is this it? Is this the moment? I think so, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really, um, I mean, you set it up so well. I think there's been decades of conversations that we've all had about artificial intelligence, where it touches ethics, where it touches public policy, 
we're a touch of civic society. I think what we're seeing now though is the beginning of, there's a, a larger chess game going on. I think Microsoft, you know, what we're seeing is the internet companies are in some sense hamstrung with making acquisitions due to antitrust laws and they're looking for growth and innovation elsewhere. If you look at the Microsoft investment in OpenAI, you see in them, if they can just actually go ahead and take a couple percentage points of market share from the search business of Google, that is so insanely valuable for Microsoft as a company. And that I think is the long-term play with OpenAI where they're powering Bing. I also think if you search, if you think about our consumer kind of IO, touches so many other parts of companies like Microsoft. They touch the gaming business, they touch the communications tools with Teams, that you'll see AI start playing not just in the front end, but in the back end of so many of their systems. You know, we just invest in a company, full disclosure as a plug, for a company called DeepL, which I encourage everyone to do, which does language translation. And now it takes literally a matter of minutes, in some cases seconds, to translate entire PDFs from English to German or other complicated languages, or German to English. And I think what we're seeing is enterprises, it always starts, the internet started also as a consumer phenomenon. The thing we always look for, cryptocurrency, is when do institutions and enterprises start putting real spend in it? What we're seeing now is that there's real B2B applications that are actually putting forth with AI in it. And I think, candidly, we're gonna see some incredible standalone companies that ideally, if we're all back here in this room five years from now, we're gonna see less concentration in the top five employers in this area. We're gonna see more distribution because of AI. But I think we're also gonna see, because it's a gold rush, some of what we saw in crypto, which is some bad actors and some people that are charlatans that are gonna come out and with this wave, try to raise as much money and defy yeah, the odds. Yeah, yeah. We're already starting to see that a little bit. So judicious investors, I think, will be able to play it, yeah. but others won't. I have, I, have, I have two thoughts about this. I, I agree that we're gonna see a lot of experimentation around AI. I, I actually wish we wouldn't call it AI because the intelligence word makes us think that it is, has its own autonom it's aut autonomy, but anyway, we'll use it. Um, we'll see a lot of startups, some of them will fail, some of them will succeed, but the choke point issue is a really interesting one because um, one of the things that makes this kind of AI possible, this amazing performance that we've seen with ChatGPT is immense computational power. Now companies cannot all afford that. Microsoft can, Google can, right. maybe Facebook can, but it, the question is whether they will remain, the, you know, maybe it's Microsoft or Google this time, they will remain the choke point and they will be sort of squeezing rents out of the many other startups that want to have to rely on their computational power. So I'm not as optimistic that the concentration will decline. I hope it does, but I think there is a real issue about just the immense cost of mounting these large language models. The only thing I'll debate on that, that, that was just an interesting thing is in 2008 when the financial crisis happened, our firm I think really didn't realize the power of the iOS and Android mobile platforms. And what we thought was Google and, and Apple would accrete the most value, they did. But actually what they created was an app ecosystem of startup companies that were actually able to keep their costs down to your point. Yeah. And actually that's where I think whether it's OpenAI to start or other large LLM models that are starting to become more platforms that could actually help find an economic model because to Anno's point right now, it's so expensive yeah. to try to build a horizontal model yeah. on your own. So Yeah, yeah no, and, and the only question is how much they, I mean, you know, the app stores now take 15, 30%. Yeah. So, so how does the, how does the, 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 the the rents that get generated, which will be huge, how does it get distributed between small companies and big companies? It speaks entirely to this question of whether Silicon Valley maintain, maintains its role as the center of innovation in the world. And going back to 2006, your point about the platforms, um, I was spending a lot of time in Europe and it looked like mobile innovation was happening first in Europe. There was Nokia, there was Symbian, and then the iPhone em emerged and all of that ecosystem stuff accreted right back to Silicon Valley. And so I've been wondering, you know, it always seems like Silicon Valley's control and centrality is related on having the next platform. Um, and the other thing that always seems to be true is the, where the next platform comes from always surprises us. And wasn't it true that six months ago we thought it was gonna be AR and VR? And now <laughs> every, everybody's shifted in like about two nanoseconds and it's AI again. I, I don't think it's shifted that quickly though. As we've said, it's been going on for a decade or so. This, these capabilities have been building behind the scenes. The, the, the capabilities are immense. And just on the Nokia thing, I went and did a study before the iPhone was released. And one of the problems, that just as the lesson for Silicon Valley, is that Nokia, which was amazingly you know, innovative at its time, it designed these really small, cool little, well sort of user interface was very good. And yet Nokia, um, 
the model that they used was a very inward looking one. They, they essentially, Nokia as a company kept everything inside. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the same time, Silicon Valley was externalizing and collaborating with a lot of small firms. And so Apple was creeping up on it and Google were creeping up on it all the time and they didn't know it, they were blindsided. So it's just one of the things that advantages Silicon Valley is this openness, the willingness to share information across even national boundaries. You know, this, this mix, we say it easily, collaboration and competition, but the idea that collaborating is actually better than me trying to hold it all inside. And that's the old model, the European model really hurt Nokia. Yeah. Um, you, you both mentioned regulation. Um, the Valley has done a great job of dodging regulation for a long time, but now crypto regulation is upon us. And it looks to me like if not the EU forcing AI regulation, some train wreck in these tools that are being rolled out so quickly might force regulation. Is, is the regulatory framework gonna be a, real, a reality? Uh, the question is time frame, right? So I, I'm personally hoping for, and actually most crypto investors also were hoping for faster regulations in the United States and globally, so we don't see what just occurred last year with the crypto meltdown. I think what we're, like, what we're likely to see in AI is regulations that come trailing, not leading, because yeah. we always see that in DC and that's one of the challenges. I think the reality is many of the companies are being more thoughtful right now after watching what happened in crypto around how do we self-regulate, how do we work with partners like Microsoft, how do we sell to enterprises that have SLAs that prevent us from doing things that could be harmful. Uh, the, the scariest part for me on artificial intelligence comes into what we're starting to see happen with deep fake videos, audios being doctored, where you could imagine use cases that become very dangerous. And we're starting to see that pop up more and more. Social media similarly went through a period, WhatsApp was utilized to arm up militias and groups, whether it's in Africa, Middle East, or India. And I think that, I'm not sure in DC people have woken up to, it's already here, it's happening. By the time that happens, I'm fearful that we may see lives lost and we may see some dangerous things. Yeah, I, 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 I think that the, I, sadly, I think regulation is unlikely to happen in the US. I mean, I think we know all the issues. We have very smart people in the Valley who know about it. We have people in Washington who know about it now, which wasn't the case in previous decades maybe. Um, but look, we haven't even passed privacy legislation. I mean, we've tried for, for years and years to just get simple legislation through Congress and it hasn't happened, but Europe will. Europe will, is very good at passing yeah. legislation, and that will put pressure, I hope, on the companies, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to ask you about one of the data points that just leaped out of me in this report, and uh, maybe it's not new, but the report, I think, notes that eight Silicon Valley households hold, hold more wealth than the combined bottom 50% um, of households, which on the face of it is, I mean, I think we know who those eight households are probably, but <laughs> one of them may have left the valley. I wonder if it still counts, but, or maybe two of them. Uh, <laughs> but what do you make of that kind of disparity? And is it a threat to, to Silicon Valley? Um, can we solve it with taxation? Well, I, I mean, I'm actually curious how many of those actually physically spend any time here because <laughs> <laughs> of taxation. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I think, uh, it, I think We've had a history though to give where we're sending a lot of credit. Um, many of the pioneers of Silicon Valley that started companies like Hewlett Packard and Intel, Cisco and others have been deeply philanthropic, have helped the community go through these different periods of inflection points. And I think it's um, you know, truthfully imperative for the next generation of billionaires to continue giving back. One way is obviously staying in the state and paying high taxes, but if you don't do that, at least setting up foundations that enable philanthropy to help those in need. Um, the thing that, the reality of the free market is, I think with this colossal size of success, that's just a derivative of, of equity ownership from the early points of time. I actually don't believe that having a prohibitively like expensive tax structure is gonna solve that problem. I actually think it's more where we started, Anno and I, thinking about how ways community involvement in health can help with those that are destitute and in difficult situations. I mean, I can say in this room, going to San Francisco, like you can see how different that place is than 20 years ago. I, I will say one Triple, optimistic yeah. thing based on this question. I was an advisor to the index when it started in 1995. It was much smaller, it was only 20 pages. But one of the things we bemoaned in the first several years was the lack of philanthropy in Silicon Valley. And today I read in the, the new data that the Silicon Valley Foundation, Community Foundation is the biggest one in the country. Mm -hmm. So something has changed, we can change, but it is a concern, John. 
One last question, we're, we're almost out of time. I, I, I'd love to ask two, but I'm gonna ask one and I'll ask them. You know, the question of Exodus, and you know, I, I, I think we called out the celebrity Exodus. Is, it, is there anything unusual about this Exodus era or is, is, is Russ right that this is, this is much more sort you know, of- You know, the politics has gotten more sort of public. There were always, you know, big, big personalities in Silicon Valley, people who bought fancy cars or whatever. But now the politics has gotten a little bit more divisive and people are leaving because of their politics. That's what's new. I, I think the interesting thing is the data shows that they're leaving while keeping their jobs here, just choosing to live elsewhere. Is that permanent or temporary is a question. We saw a huge exodus in the pandemic to Miami, a lot of young people going for crypto. Most, many of them are back, by the way. Um, <laughs> I think, I think we, we'll see these kinds of things happen. I think Silicon Valley, though, is such a unique place that I've talked to many friends anecdotally who have traveled and live elsewhere and have come back. Most who live permanently do it for family reasons. They yeah. grew up in an area, they have grandparents and you know, friends. But I, I'm personally, uh, I think if we can solve the immigration issue and if we can figure out a little bit of how to solve some of the civic society issues, there's very few places like this on the planet Earth. Okay, this is good. We're nice out of time. Not, not Detroit, not yet. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>